I keep going, talking about Eve, because she was deceived and I can be deceived too. The last time we talked about her, we focused on the fact that she was honest, which she was. But I want to look at the fact that she was intelligent, because she was. In fact, the deception of the devil would have been less powerful if she hadn't been so intelligent. <laughs> it was something that appeals to wisdom. His lie was. She knew all the Bible there was. She even knew how to draw a necessary inference that she shouldn't even touch it. But the devil called into question God's motives. And as we say, it was a trap intended for those who are intelligent, for those who have this world's wisdom, if you will, to acknowledge that, yes, God said that, but do you know why he said that? You know, that's the devil's tale. It wasn't because you'll die. No, no, no. It's because he doesn't want you to be in on it. But that is the devil's lie. That's the devil's tale. That's what's appealing to those who are intelligent, who don't want to be thought of as less than intelligent, who don't want to be fools or dupes. But the account says in 2 Corinthians 11.3, I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere, pure devotion to Christ. And we'll revisit this, but that's Paul's fear, and it should be my fear. She was deceived, I can be deceived. I'm not smarter than she was. Well, let's talk about the deception of 2 Corinthians 11.3. The serpent deceived her, how? And there's actually a record in the New Testament of multiple sources of deception. It can come for me. It can come in many different forms. One thing was recorded in Romans 7, where Paul describes the fact that the law of Moses was good and right, that it taught what was true, that it made clear what was clean and what was not clean, and yet, and yet, Sin was able to use it, to leverage it. He said in Romans 7, beginning at verse 7, what should we say? Is the law sin? By no means. If it, if it hadn't been for the law, I wouldn't have known sin. I wouldn't have known what it is to covet if the law had, said, had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. Apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. The law itself is holy. The commandment is holy and righteous and good. But see, sin can use the commandment to deceive us. There's an opportunity there. He said, I wouldn't have known what, what covetousness was if it hadn't defined it. But then sin used that definition to appeal to me all the time and to call to me to do this thing that I knew I wasn't supposed to be doing. That's how the devil worked. That's what he said to Eve. Oh, what did God really say about this? And we're focusing in on the one thing that God said she couldn't have. That's how it works. Deception comes via the commandment sometimes. Things that you wouldn't have thought of or that weren't appealing to you. You know that the commandment teaches those things, and then maybe the devil can get you to think about those a little bit longer than you should. Also in Romans, in the 16th chapter, deception comes in this form too. In the 16th chapter of Romans, at the 17th, Paul said to the churches of the 16th verse, I appeal to you, brothers, watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine you have been taught and avoid them. 
For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ with their own appetites, and by smooth talk and flattery they deceive the hearts of the naive. Smooth talk and flattery deceive. And that's also true of what the devil said to Eve. He spoke smoothly, and it was flattering her to tell her that she had an intelligence that was untapped. She had a wisdom that was untapped. There was something behind that fruit that she could realize the rest of her potential. That was flattery. It was a lie. Flattery is lying, by the way. (laughs) Don't do it. Flattery is lying. Uh, Our son is, is taking a class on business communication, and they were teaching him about marketing. And he was talking to me. He said, Dad, I think that it's just another word for lying. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, pretty much. That's true. (laughs) But flattery is just lying. Smooth talking flattery, though, that's deceptive with those who don't know, who are unsuspecting. And that's how it works. Not thinking about, well, why would he say this to me? You know, that's a great irony. The devil saying, well, you know why God said that to you? Is, hold on a minute, devil. Why are you saying this to me? (laughs) She didn't stop and question the devil's motives when the devil questioned God's motives. It happens. That's the great irony of it. And Ephesians says the same Ephesians chapter 5, just breaking that thought a little bit, but that's where, in its context, he describes the way of the world being contrary to the way of God, and that these things shouldn't be named among the saints, you know, verse 5, verse 3 rather. Let there be no filthiness or foolish talk, crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. And in the sixth verse, importantly, let no one deceive you with empty words. Because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the the sons of disobedience. They are saying, see, in the Romans 16 uh, uh, example, Smooth talk and flattery deceives the hearts of the unsuspecting. In the Ephesians example, empty words deceive us into thinking that the judgment of God doesn't come on the sons of disobedience. That's what they have in common. They Both of them are saying that God's wrath is not going to come on the sons of disobedience. Those who commit these sins are going to be just fine. Smooth talk, empty talk, flattery. From without and then from within, 1 Corinthians 3. In the 18th verse, Paul said, Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he's wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. Humility is necessary. But when I'm thinking to myself, that I am wise in this age, I am knowing, I am the one who, who, you know, this is not for me, this is for somebody else, you know. <laughs> like all those lessons about self-righteousness. <laughs> those are great lessons for, for the rest of you, you know, I don't need it. <laughs> That's how it goes. <laughs> When I get thinking this way, I'm self-deceived is what's happening. That's when they come and get you. When Eve was thinking, she had the ability to discern why did God say this? As if, you know, she hadn't been born yesterday. But she was. (laughs) Literally. (laughs) We were. We didn't know anything about this except what God told us about this. Why should we think? That we are in the position of knowing why God said what he said or why it should be the way God says it should be. It's not for us to, to whittle on God's end of the stick. 
And for that matter, you have James 1 on the other side of it that, you know, 1 Corinthians is talking about who is wise, where does wisdom come from? That's a focus on the spiritual, the heavenly, the God who created us. But James 1 is the focus on those who are around about us. And he says in the 26th verse, if anyone thinks he's religious and doesn't bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religious religion is worthless. It's self-deceived, you see. He's deceiving his own heart who thinks he's religious but doesn't bridle his tongue, doesn't control what he says or how he treats other people. So the meaning of that. That religion's worthless. Whatever religion you got, it's not worth anything. It's not helping if you're not living right, if you're not speaking what is right. That's self-deceptive. So deception comes from lots of places is what we're saying. The reason why Paul can say, I'm afraid that as Satan deceived Eve, your thoughts may be led astray, is because it comes from lots of places. It comes, you know, by way of the commandment itself, just we, we maybe are just thinking too, too long on some things that are, that are just not for us. They're not ours. We maybe are thinking too highly of ourselves. We maybe are listening to people who are not telling us what is true, whose motives we ought to be questioning. You know, deception comes in lots of different ways. But the other thing he said there at 2 Corinthians 11, 3, was that Satan deceived Eve by means of his cunning. And we ought to look at that word for cunning. We already referred um, to 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 18. But you ought to look too at the 19th verse of that. Let no one deceive himself if anyone thinks he's wise in this age. Let him become a fool that he may become wise, for the wisdom of this world is folly with God. As it is written, he catches the wise in their cunning. That's actually what it says. Craftiness is cunning. But if we think ourselves wise, we ought to think we ought to become fools. The wisdom of this world is folly with God. And that goes back to the garden, Genesis 3. Oh, God knows the day you eat of it, you'll be wise like he is. Hmm. No, the wisdom of this world is folly. That's what the snake said. Why listen to him? And the quotation at 1 Corinthians 3.19 from the Old Testament, he catches the wise in their craftiness, their cunning. This is the deception. We know that Eve was intelligent because the cunning had somewhere to land. It meant something to her. And that still works today. When we are wise in our own eyes, we get caught by this thing. It's the hook. The other thing that you find is that those who mimic the activity of Satan are said to be practicing cunning. For example, in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 2. He said, we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we'd commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. The apostles refused to do this, but not others. Others have disgraceful and underhanded ways. Others do practice cunning and tamper with God's word. Not an open statement of truth, but in hiding what they really are and what they really believe. That is a satanic practice that follows the pattern of Genesis 3. And Ephesians warns us in the fourth chapter as well that one of the reasons why God has given us spiritual leaders in the 11th verse of Ephesians 4 is to equip the saints in the 12th verse 
with an end in mind, the 14th, that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. And yes, they're carried about by craftiness in deceitful schemes. That is the same cunning as the cunning of Satan in 2 Corinthians 11.3. It's true. There are those who practice cunning and tamper with God's word. There are those among the children of God who are too childish, who have not matured and remain children, Ephesians 4.14, who are tossed to and fro by waves, who are carried by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Those are satanic practices. You see what's happening there that sometimes people will practice cunning. They do have an ulterior motive, a reason why they're saying this to you. That is not God's reasons. Now, if you go back to the letter of 2 Corinthians, think about it this way with me. The other thing that the apostle said at 2 Corinthians 11.3 was, your thoughts may be led astray, as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts may be led astray. And the fact is that this word for thoughts appears a few times before 2 Corinthians 11. The first time is in the second chapter. And what, you're, what you'll find here is that there is a progression of these thoughts in the letter of 2 Corinthians. At the second chapter, in the 11th verse, where he said, we should not be outwitted by Satan, we are not ignorant of his designs. That word, his, his designs, is literally his thoughts. And it's the same thoughts that may be led astray in 2 Corinthians 11.3, that we have thoughts. Well, Satan has thoughts too. And so the second chapter is kind of like a bookend with the 11th chapter where thoughts are in focus. First, we find out that, you know, they have practiced discipline, which is good. They followed through on 1 Corinthians 5. And now he calls on them to follow through with the rest of this, which is the seventh verse, return, forgive, and comfort so that he may not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I beg you, reaffirm your love for him so that we would not be outwitted by Satan. We have to follow through, of course, with discipline. It's hard to get churches to do discipline, but it's probably even harder to get them to follow through with the forgiveness afterwards. It seems a little too permanent, I should say. When somebody has been restored, they still don't get called on to lead prayers or to lead singing sometimes. and I don't see any Bible for that. If they're restored to the Lord, why can't they be restored to the assembly? We shouldn't be outwitted by Satan. We're not ignorant of his thoughts. He has thoughts too, you know. He has plans. He has designs. I put the third and the fourth chapter together on this because there is actually a lengthy discussion about the ministry of death in verse 7, referring uh, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 7, referring to the law of Moses, how that the law of Moses was glorious. For a time, it made Moses' face shine, and he put a veil over his face. But that was passing away, and what we have is far more glorious in Christ Jesus. That's the thought here from the third chapter all the way through the fourth chapter here, talking about the light uh, of the knowledge of Christ. 
But the 14th verse of 2 Corinthians 3 said their minds were hardened. For the, to this day when they read the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. It said, um, I should back up there in the 12th, since we have such a hope, we're very bold, not like Moses who would put a veil over his face so the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end, but their minds were hardened. This word for minds is the word thoughts. That our thoughts could be led astray. Their thoughts had been led astray. In fact, their thoughts had been hardened the same way that Pharaoh's heart had been hardened when he refused to let them go out of the land of Egypt. Their minds became hardened in that time in the wandering in the wilderness. When did Moses put a veil on his face? This is well after when they're wandering in the wilderness. This is much later. It's at that time they have had hardened minds. We might say hardened hearts, but their minds, their thoughts were hardened against God. They're not listening to him anymore. You might liken it to Hebrews 5, saying, you know, you have become dull of hearing. It's actually sluggish or slow of hearing. I think of that as hardening of the mind. Very similar. But as he continues this thought and talks about the fact that we have this ministry by the mercy of God and we refuse to tamper with God's word or practice cunning. He finishes with the fourth, the third and the fourth verses, even if our gospel is veiled like Moses was, it's veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. That's the thoughts. The God of this world has blinded the thoughts of the, unbeliever, of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. That's 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. That's their thoughts, which had been hardened. They can be hardened. They can be blinded. They can be led astray. 2 Corinthians 11.3. These are the thoughts of the perishing their minds were hardened, their minds were blinded, they couldn't see the light of God. And today, if they're reading the Old Testament in the same way, they're blinded, they're veiled, they're not seeing it because it's only taken away in Christ. Only in Christ does the Old Testament make sense. Only in Christ does the Old Testament have its fulfillment. And the other place where it occurs prior to 2 Corinthians 11 is the 10th chapter where he says, just that fifth verse by itself, for example, he says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. These are the same thoughts that may be led astray. These are the same thoughts that may be hardened, the same thoughts that may be blinded. And here in the fifth chapter, I'm sorry, in the, in the tenth chapter, in the fifth verse, he's saying at the fourth verse, the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power. We're destroying arguments lofty opinions, and taking thoughts captive. We don't have fleshly warfare. We have spiritual warfare. The thoughts do matter. People say, don't hurt to look. Yes, it does. The thoughts matter. Jesus said, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Yes, it does matter. It, does, it can hurt to look. The thoughts are to be captive to Christ. So there's a pattern there leading up to what he says. It is what it is. The pattern is false teachers. Notice that pattern. 
Not just in the second uh, Corinthian letter, although that's clear, but in all the places that we have looked at. Over in Romans 16, remember when he said to them, smooth talk and flattery deceives? Remember that? Who is it? He said it's those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. What do we do? He said, watch out for them and avoid them. Why avoid them? Because they do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own bellies. They're causing divisions. They're creating obstacles. They're contrary to the teaching. We should identify them and avoid them. They're not serving the Lord. They're serving themselves. In Ephesians 5, verses 5 through 7, again, we, we read earlier, you can be sure of this. Everyone sexually immoral or impure, everyone covetous or idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. It is because of these things the wrath of God comes on the sons of dis disobedience. Therefore, Ephesians 5, 7, do not become partners with them. That is, partakers or having fellowship together. You have to break those ties of fellowship. Or as Ephesians 5.11 said, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather lay them bare, expose them. Very similar to what you read in Romans 16.17, to mark them and avoid them. We read earlier, 2 Corinthians 4.2, that the apostles renounced disgraceful, underhanding ways. The apostles refused to practice cunning or tamper with God's word and have an open statement of the truth that commends them. But it's clear that the opposite of this is also true, that there are others who have not renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. That's actually how they operate. There are others who do practice cunning, who do tamper with God's word, who are not openly stating the truth, who do not have the truth to bear testimony to what they say, because what they say is not the truth. Those are false teachers, aren't they? In Ephesians 4, when he talked about us no longer being children, tossed to and fro by the waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Where does the wind of doctrine blow from? <laughs> human cunning? What humans? Craftiness and deceitful schemes. Isn't it the false teachers? Yes. Yes, it is. And at 2 Corinthians 10, what we talked about just a moment ago, as he said, we, are have, we have a warfare that isn't fleshly. We have a warfare that is spiritual, that's focused, you know, it's not using human relationships to squeeze people. It is using the, the doctrine of God to take thoughts captive. But notice this, con this uh, context, because it's important to what we're about to talk about. In the second through the fifth verses of 2 Corinthians 10, I beg of you, Oh no, make it the first verse. I, Paul, myself entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I, who am humble when face to face with you, but bold toward you when I'm away. That's what they say about him. I beg of you that when I'm present, I may not have to show the boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. He's saying, don't make me show up and have to be like this. That's what he's saying. Though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. They have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. He said, I beg of you, when I come, I do not want to show boldness and confidence the way that they slanderously report that we do, as if we take this into our own hands and fight a human battle, a human warfare, like I'm going to show up and be a bully. That's not what he's going to do. The power is in the word. 
But that's what leads to the 11th chapter in the second verse. I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband to present you a pure virgin to Christ. That sounds just like Ephesians 5, doesn't it? That we are the bride of Christ. Yes, indeed. A divine jealousy I feel for you. I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and a pure devotion to Christ? Why? Why are you afraid? Because, the fourth verse, if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one that you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. Is that a reason to be afraid? Yep, it is. That is frightening. Somebody comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one the apostles proclaimed? A different spirit they receive? A different gospel they accept? As in somebody comes and teaches this way and they have a different Jesus, they have a different spirit, they have a different gospel, and they put up with it readily enough that passes. He said, I feel a divine jealousy for you. You know, God doesn't appreciate you cozying up to the world. You're supposed to be his husband. I'm afraid. I feel divine jealousy for you. I'm afraid that your thoughts will be led astray. Why? Because I can see that when false teachers come your way, you put up with it. It's like real estate, right? The three most important things, right? In real estate, the three most important things are location, location, and location, right? The top three problems facing the church are fellowship, fellowship, and fellowship. They put up with it readily enough. That's what happens. That's why the open fellowship movement has been so successful. It is the majority now of the non-institutional churches because they put up with it readily enough. It's a different Jesus. It's a different gospel. But man, I've known him for a long time. Our, our families go back a long way. Oh, you know, my cousin attends there, and I don't think he would put up with that. We find ways to put up with it and to go along, to get along with one another, but we're forgetting that we have to get along with God. Paul's afraid with good reason. That's why he's saying what he's saying, and you can see that it is the pattern all of what uh, Satan did there. You know, the cunning, the craftiness, the scheming, it, it's all there. The tampering with God's word, the disgraceful and, and underhanded things, the lies, the flattery, the smooth talk, it's all there. It's all there. That's exactly the way that the teaching is being done. And it's not so much that people are doing that because it's going to happen. Somebody's going to do it. It's inevitable, as Jesus said, that stumbling blocks should come. But woe to that man through whom they come. It's going to happen, but what are you going to do about it? Well, what the churches have done about it, by and large, is to put up with it readily enough. So he's afraid, and that's, uh, that's, that's reasonable. We ought to be afraid. We've got to be willing to take a hard look at ourselves, at our practices, at our ties and our fellowship, and measure ourselves not against ourselves, but against the Bible. 
So yeah, he's got good reasons to be afraid. Now, we talked last time as well in 1 John chapters 1 and 2, and this I'll remind you of rather than reading through at the moment, just in closing. But 1 John 1 and 2 bring to you the complete truth about the nature of our sins that are intentional and otherwise, and the nature of our fellowship with God. Among the things that he says there is, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's trustworthy to forgive us if we come clean with him, if we confess in honesty the way that our mother did. And we'll be cleansed in the blood of Jesus. This much we know from 1 John. He said, I write this that you may not sin, and yet, and that's chapter 2, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus the righteous. We are not supposed to sin, and yet, the deception had power with Mother Eve because she was intelligent and she didn't want to be left out. And she could comprehend that, well, that would explain why you would say something like this. And that would mean, you know, well, there must be a good reason for hiding that from me. You know, this is all the way that an intelligent person thinks. And so she was deceived, and so we can be deceived. And the writing of John is intended to keep us from doing wrong. Jesus didn't die that we might charge it up to the Master, but that we might put sin behind us. And yet, we know that's not the way it's going to happen. We're not going to live a sinless, perfect life from here to eternity. We're going to have occasions of stumbling. We're going to sin somewhere at some time. And we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus, the righteous, who knows what it is to be one of us. In chapter 2, he said, whoever says, I know him and doesn't keep his commandments is wrong about that. The truth is not in that person. We must obey him, as we read earlier in the letters. Any that would say you can commit any of these sins and be all right, the judgment of God won't come, they're lying. That's not true. You know that the, the judgment of God comes on the sons of disobedience. We must obey. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. Yes, I'm going to sin from time to time, and there's going to be mistakes. I know it's going to happen at some point. But God has provided for that. He knows that too. He's provided an advocate for us. He's provided a sacrifice for us, a way that we might be able to, re, to be restored to him. What is my charge is to live from here on with a, with a resolve to press on, to mature, to perfect the love of God by keeping his word. Today, are you a Christian? You've got to get started on that journey. Don't believe the lies. Don't believe the devil. God has our best interests at heart. God knows what it is to be one of us. That's why his son Jesus came to live on this earth, in inhabiting the flesh. And we have that advocate with the Father, somebody in heaven, at the right hand of God, who can speak up for you, who knows what it's like. That is yours in Christ Jesus, if you obey the gospel. And, and then you, you will not be tempted beyond what you're able. God will always provide a way of escape. But that's for Christians. If you're not a Christian, you don't have that promise. And you don't have that hope. You think you'll escape one day. No, not without Jesus. You had better obey the gospel while you still know what's right. Before the birds of the air come and... and uh, Eat up that seed before Satan takes the word from your heart. Obey the gospel before it's too late. If today you are a Christian and haven't lived right, let us pray with you and for you that you might be restored to God. If you need our prayers, if you need to be baptized, let your need be known in the Spirit by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected. <laughs>